The path of the righteous is like the dawning of a new day. It grows brighter and brighter until the full day has come. The path of the righteous is like the dawning of a new day. The Bible said it goes, grows brighter and brighter until the full light has come. I call you out of the turmoil of the light day followed by the dark day followed by the light day followed by the dark day followed by the dark day followed by the dark day followed by one more light day and this roller coaster ride of inconsistency from glory to glory get this get this been saying this now here for for over four years there are no seasons in heaven so quit believing that the kingdom works winter to spring to summer to fall the unredeemed earth works from winter to spring to summer to fall. The yet to be redeemed cosmos still works seasonally. But the Bible said in heaven that the trees bear fruit 12 months out of the year. And then says those leaves of those trees are for the healing of the nations. Come on, we, we, hear, we hear this, but we need to hear this this morning. Why would you put the healing of the nations on the leaves of trees in heaven? Wouldn't you put the leaves that heal the nations in the nations? See, when you begin to awaken to the revelation that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is not a fanciful, impossible prayer that was just called to tease us to make us hungry for heaven. That he really believed that people would pray until his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what that would then mean? That would mean the trees of our land begin to bear leaves 12 months out of the year that are for the healing of the nations. This seasonal consciousness has created permission for inconsistency. That's why you burn sometimes and you're dry sometimes and you call it a winter or a valley. I'm, in, I'm on the mountain right now, but I'm in the valley, but I'll cycle back around. And you're in the misery of that cycle. But the kingdom goes from glory to glory, not winter to spring to summer to fall. I actually believe Jesus went through the great winter on our behalf so we could live in the perpetual spring. So our Song of Solomon says, Lo, winter has passed. Behold, spring has come and His beloved is dancing on the mountains. That sounds better than bracing for winter. He's changing the narrative. He's filling us with hope. And in, I want to say I want to say this, and then we're going to shift some things. Never make the mistake of trying to balance the hope of the Christ with the hopelessness of the culture. That does not create balance; it creates double-mindedness. And the Bible said a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Could it be that much of the instability we're seeing within the church culture is a consequence of people trying to balance their hope and hopelessness? I release you from the mindset that it's supposed to get worse and worse and worse until you get snatched off the globe. I declare brighter and brighter and brighter until the full day. Come on, that, that, that stone not hewed with hands out of Daniel is growing into a great mountain in the earth. That mustard seed leaven of the kingdom is beginning to produce something authentic and inexplainable. Yes. How could something that great come from something that small? It was surrendered into the hands of the multiplier. Amen. Yahweh, I just declare hope over a people. I, I as a... In, in humility as a testimony I thank you that I'm finished with seasons I thank you that you don't let me go through great periods of depression so can, I can appreciate the time I'm not in depression but literally I live in an anxiety free world stress was not your design Anxiety would be anxious for nothing, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. 
I say concerning you, let not your heart be troubled. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But in my Father's house are many mansions. And I go that I may prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. I rescue that from dispensationalism. He did not say so that where I'm going, there you may be also. He said so that where I am. Not about heaven. Not about heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. If it were not so, I would have not told you. But in my Father's house are many mansions. You know what that word mansion means? Speaking places. Not, not really big houses. In my Father's house, there's a place for your voice. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Where is he? Seated in heavenly places. Far above principalities and powers. The most quoted verse from the Old Testament in the New Testament is sit here until I make your enemy your footstool. Till I make your enemy, Matt's been teaching us, till I make your enemy a stool for your feet. The most quote, did you know that? The most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament is Psalm 110. Sit here until I make your enemy your footstool. I'm telling you. This, this thing of one day you got the devil by the throat and one day he's got you by the throat is a lie. Come on. He's defeated. He's bound and does not even own the keys to his own world. I feel hope in that. Do you feel hope in that? I'm telling you right here, 2018, having the time of my life, I am less conscious of hell right now than I ever have been at any other point in my journey. You know what it gave me permission for? Obsession with the superior dimension. I feel like I've at least smelled those trees planted by that river that their leaves are for the healing of the nations. I've at least smelled the wind blow on the front porch of my house and said, I've been alive 44 years and I've never smelled that before. And Yahweh said, that's because what's growing in my world is starting to grow in yours. Smells like home. In the midst of the paradise of God. You know, three times outside of the book of Genesis, when the Bible talks about Eden, it either calls it the paradise of God or God's paradise. I thought it was Adam's garden. It was only paradise for Adam because of the degree of Yahweh's presence made manifest there. It was actually Yahweh's paradise. And Adam might have lost his, but Yahweh never lost his. And he's calling you and I back to a garden again. To walk with him in the cool of the day and see sights we've never seen and smell smells we've never smelt and have feelings we've never felt before. And it is invigorating me to want to go after the flawless face of the only begotten Son of God in a way I never have before. I bless you with that. I see some differences in your face. You get another appointment. You're getting another appointment. You're not going to live the next 10 years talking about what happened to you 20 years ago. You're going to live the next 10 years going, everything I used to call good is being dwarfed in the reality of what I'm experiencing as good now. Moses, I'm going to let you sit down, I promise, but I want you to get something here. Moses knows he's to transition the children of Israel. And he says to Yahweh, I will not go unless your presence goes with us. Yahweh said, done. He said, well, I got you in a good mood. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. I I think I'll tell this story right here. This became such a revelation to me. I think I'll tell this as long as I'm alive. Yahweh puts Moses in the cleft of the rock. And do you know what the scripture says? And causes all of his goodness to passing by. Does not use the word glory. Moses asked for glory and Yahweh taught us what glory is. 
a manifestation of all of his goodness. Religion said Jesus will come help you survive while all the badness passes in front of you. Moses said, show me your glory. A man who had murdered another man and hid his body in the sand. A man who had flirted on and off with paganism, according to church history, most of his life. Till his encounter with a burning bush on the mountain. Dares to say, not because he's perfect, not because he's so filled with faith. Moses is continually waffling back and forth between the opinion of Yahweh and the opinion of the people. But in a pure, sincere heart, in a moment, he says, show me your glory. And Yahweh says, first thing I'm going to have to do is redefine glory. The glory of Yahweh is that all of his goodness is passing you by. Happy is the man whose sins are forgiven him. Never to be chased again. Never to be tormented again. You know what? Legally cannot even be accused again. Not only did he rip up the accusations, he muzzled the mouth of the accuser. Somebody needs to hear that. Not only did he rip up the accusations, he muzzled the mouth of the accuser so not even the accusation could be used against you again. As far as the east is from the west. Feel freedom today? Are you sure? You feel hope today? I used to teach or preach or have people lead songs about hope from a posture of wishing. It's a massive difference. I used to teach or preach hope from a posture of wishing. But to teach and preach hope from a posture of of being seated in hope brings a whole nother degree of hope. We're not talking about fanciful wishing. We're not talking about fantasizing. We're talking about a hope that is being actualized within a company of people who are daring to believe nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen? Amen? I feel to do this and then we'll shift. I'm going to have Johnson come receive with a tithe and offering just a moment. But I feel to do this First, Melanie, where's Melanie? Did I lose her? Come up here, Melanie. I, I want Melanie to pray over marriages because I feel that Yahweh is doing something in impossible situations in marriages specifically today. So I'm, I'm going to have her come and she's going to make a, a decree and a declaration out of the hope that nothing is too hard for the Lord. She's going to pray, but this is what I want you to do. I want everybody to lift their hands because I'm not trying to single anybody out. But if you've got some issues going on within your marriage and you need a transformation and a breakthrough, you are, you are standing in the presence of people who witness that that is not only possible, it's happening all over this room. Come on. If you, if you just everybody lift your hand. We're not trying to single anybody out. But I, I see grace coming to marriages this morning. our hearts come and invade our hearts and draw us deeper into that intimacy with you Lord that creates an atmosphere of hope and joy and resurrection life within marriages God I just speak life into marriages that only you can do Lord that only you can do I, I speak rest over the striving. I speak rest over the, the burden of carrying a marriage that seems like it's failing, that seems like it'll never be what you dreamed it would be. I just speak rest over that. No more striving. No more striving because God is just invading that situation. He's invading that situation. He's invading the hearts. 
He's transforming hearts, as he's transforming minds, as he's drawing husbands and wives into an intimacy that is only possible in the love of God. Lord, we elevate you today. We elevate you today. We say that you're the giver of life. You're the giver of wholeness. You fill every dark space, every crevice, every hopeless spot, Lord. And God, for those who have been asking for the resurrection of their marriage, God, oh, yes, I say, I say, I know what you can do, Lord. I know that you do things greater than we could ever ask we could ever hope for, Lord. So do it again. If you'll do it for me, God, you'll do it for anybody. Come, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I break off the bondage of armor. I break off the bondage of armor, especially that women would carry, but that would prevent vulnerability. I used to wear an armor. And as I was baptized, I had learned what it was like to take the armor off so that I could communicate, so that I could be intimate, so that I could be vulnerable. I, knew, I saw it and I knew it was there and I would take it off and then I would operate and then I would pick it back up somehow. But then I was baptized in water and in hope and the armor melted off. Melted off. Those around me saw it, and I didn't know what was happening. But there is a place. There's a place that you can walk. There's a place that you can dwell. There's a place of intimacy that you can go where there is no armor. There is no armor. Go ahead. Go ahead. God, do what only you can do. I speak the melting of armor. You no longer have to be protected. You are safe. You are safe in the arms of Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. I speak boldness and courage. I speak boldness and courage in these marriages, Lord. I speak oneness, Lord. Oh, I speak oneness, God. Take us into places in our marriages that we've never been before, God. Take us to places, God, in our marriages. Do something with this oneness that only you can do, God, that we can't do alone. Thank you, Lord. Take us into these places, Lord, that we didn't dream were possible. Take us into the joy that you've designed us for. Take us into the fullness of life in these marriages. Pouring hope onto children. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You're doing it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Come on, lift your hands one more time. You're going to have grace to open up. Expose your vitals. Come on. Expose.
expose your vitals. You're not protecting yourself. You're insulating yourself from the degree of encounter that brings transformation. Open up. Open up to hope. Come on. Even if you were wounded in hopelessness, dare to believe this time you're opening up in a different environment. And this is a hope that Romans said does not have the capacity for disappointment. Come on, that's the Bible. Does not have the capacity for disappointment. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can begin to make your way back to your seat this morning. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. going to prepare in just a moment to receive the tithe and offering. This, we say this is the only traffic jam in Saluda County is in this building right now when people are leaving this altar. So This is what the rest of the world deals with. Hallelujah, we do not. Went to visit Carson in Houston the other day. Spent Tammy and I went together, spent a couple of days in Houston and shouted glory to God when we got back to a place where we didn't have to spend it may take us a 45 minutes to get somewhere, but we are going further than two miles. I don't mind driving 45 minutes as long as I cover 48 miles in that 45 minute time period. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, me, let me dovetail off Melanie's uh, revelation this morning. Because I know, I, know how, I know how you were trained in some ways because I know how I was trained. And I know how I'm being untrained and I want you to be untrained. The problem with getting people to change the way they think is you have to get them to use the same brain that generated the original thought. And to repent, metanoia, that Greek word literally means to change the way that you think. So to repent is not, many of us, and I want to unteach you, okay? Many of us were taught that repent means to turn and go in the other direction. And it does not. Repent means to change the way that you think. The resultant consequence of a change of thought is a change of direction. To attempt to change the direction without changing the thought process that generated the direction is an exercise in futility because you're eventually going to travel back in the direction of your thoughts. But when we start talking to people about thinking differently, when you hear a statement like, take the armor off, you go, well, but the Bible said put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, loins girt about with truth, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See how we know that so well? It did not say put on the full armor of Rome even though that's what the armor was a description of. It said put on the full armor of God what kind do you think he's wearing? There's an analogy of a Roman soldier. But the invitation is not to put on the full armor of Rome. It's to put on the full armor of God. Which is not a helmet. It's salvation. In your thinking. It's righteousness as a breastplate giving you permission to expose your vitals. Righteousness lets you go, I'm righteous, therefore I have no fear in giving access to my vitals. I'm so righteous that I don't even have to fear you wounding me anymore. We took the helmet of salvation and we made it a Roman war helmet. And God doesn't wear a helmet because He doesn't war like that. He wars like this. Bye, little nation. This is, come on, let me just show you. I don't have a footstool and I have tight hamstrings. So I'm not putting both of them up and put, 
Petri couldn't either because he's chubby. But mine's just tight hamstrings. Okay, so. <laughs> this is how Yahweh wars. And the invitation from Paul is put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. And then the analogy for that culture would have been a Roman soldier. What does God's helmet look like? A crown. So to put on the full armor of God is not to put on the... I'm fixing... If y'all don't get this, I'm going to throw something at you until you get it. The full armor of God. What kind of... Do you think God said, that devil is at it again? Let me put my Roman soldier helmet on. Put on the full armor of Yahweh. Religion made Lucifer God's great arch enemy. But that is an illegal thought process. Lucifer is not the opposite of God. Lucifer is the opposite of Michael. God has no opposite. We have elevated the devil to being God's appropriate opponent. And it is an embarrassing descent away from the totality of the greatness of God. Put on the full armor of God doesn't mean put on a Roman helmet. It means put on a crown. Breastplate of righteousness. Four times that I have in my current notes, righteousness is identified as a robe. What if the breastplate is not a Roman soldier's breastplate? I know that's what they did in the play at your church. But what if it's a robe of righteousness that says I'm so right with him that I don't have to spend the rest of my life guarding my vitals? I knew something happened in Melanie the day that I was able to baptize her. I actually held her like a little girl and scooped her up from the baptismal tank and handed her to her husband. Because, and I don't think you'll mind me saying this, because part of the issue is you never had a father appropriately give you away. But I then begin to watch the progress of the armor fall off. And I have moment I can remember walking from my vehicle towards your fire pit. And you had on a camouflage sweatshirt. And you and I embraced. And in that moment, I knew she belongs to me. She's as much my daughter as she is his wife. She's as much my daughter as he is my son. But what had to happen for that connection to take place is not me love her and not her love me. It was her let me in because she was so convinced she was beloved in her relationship with him, she didn't have to fear exposing herself to me. That makes people uncomfortable because they don't understand the kingdom. It makes people uncomfortable because they don't understand the kingdom. Because what we were taught by religion is protect yourself. People will wound you. But I'm telling you, an absolute revelation that convinces you of righteousness causes you to no longer fear the wounds of people because you're far too seated in beloved identity with Him. The shield of faith. Oh God. See, in the Roman culture, the shield's what you hide behind. If you're putting on the whole armor of God, what does His shield of faith look like? I'm going to get one word for you. I'm going to show you this and we're going to receive the offering. Invincibility. I'm, I'm, listen, go with me here. Not oh crap. They're back. The full armor of God, not a Roman soldier. 
get, is, am I making this clear? The analogy is a Roman soldier. The reality is Paul said, put on the full armor of God. How many of you believe the sword is the sword of a Roman soldier? No, it's the word of the Lord. Then why make the shield the shield of a Roman soldier? If the sword is the word of God, then maybe the shield is the faith of God. I know, I know you don't want to hear that because you were trained to believe that the way we insulate ourselves against that mean, bad, awful devil is get super, 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 super armored up. And I have a question for you. How's that working? I have seen more demons delivered in this meeting, in these meetings, without fanfare than I ever have seen demons delivered when we were talking to them and fusing them together and giving them glory in the room. I've seen people get delivered from demons in the parking lot walking toward this place. I'm just telling you stuff we've seen. And we did not have to get blood coming up in our mouth and get nine big ushers to pin them to the floor. Helmet of salvation. Think about your salvation the way that Yahweh thinks about your salvation. Bless, breastplate of righteousness. See your heart protected by way of a status called righteousness. Shield of faith. Approach impossibility seated in the reality of invincibility. Well, brother, we're not invincible. Well, no weapon. What kind of... Now I'm a, what kind of shield do you need? If no weapon <laughs> that is formed against you will be able to prosper. If a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near your dwelling. If the battle is not yours, but the battle belongs to the Lord, what kind of shield do you need? Confidence in the invincibility of the one who has seated you in righteousness and caused you to think appropriately about salvation. The belt or the girded loin of truth. You and I fall apart at the deepest points of how we're to be connected when we partner with a lie. So literally he said, I'm going to hold everything about what I've robed you in together. Listen, what if you saw it not as the robe a soldier wore, but the one that held the robe together? The truth that ties that righteousness to you. I'm, uh, this is really amazing. This is really good news. Unless you want everybody to think you got there by way of how doggone strong and good a soldier you are. Do you know I have seen preachers for years get dressed up in combat boots and camouflage pants and get up and call the whole church to be soldiers? But you know the Bible also says you're to be a sheep. But I've never seen a preacher dress up like a sheep in my whole life. Have you? Is it just me? Or have you never seen a preacher get up and go, bah. I came in this world today to tell you we're supposed to be sheep. Why? Because it's sexier to be a soldier than it is to be a sheep. But you know you're to actually be a soldier the exact same way you're to actually be a sheep? I had to sit down for that one. You are to actually be a soldier the same way you're to actually be a sheep. And that messes with this masculine definition of Christianity that creates the vulnerability that says, I am willing to finally admit I did not get here by might and I did not get here by power. I got here by the Spirit of the Lord. How did you end up in this place? I, not because of my knowledge, not because of my experience, not because of my gift, not because of my intellect. I got here by way of mercy that is new every morning. And there's a glory that is not given to Yahweh until you and I quit pretending we strutted our way into this because of the value of our armor. Do you know what truth does? Truth takes the robe that never really fits you right 
and ties righteousness to you in such a way that no longer do you allow... A, are you getting what I'm saying? To This is blowing my mind as I'm getting it. I hope I'm... Quit, quit playing that, as a matter of fact, okay? I feel like that makes me hurry, like this is a, this is a commercial between the offering. And I'm fixing to sit on this stool for a minute. He is taking the lie that has untied the robe of righteousness from you. And he's giving you a truth that is causing you to divorce your partnership with the lie that, you, yeah, you are righteous, but I had a bad day today. And religion taught us that affected our status as righteous. And there's a truth that gets tied around you that ties that robe of righteousness to you, that what was loosely connected to you begins to be adhered to you in such a way that you now actually find the robe that fits you. Do you know why righteousness doesn't fit in religion? Because it's not been connected yet to the belt of truth. We've partnered with a lie. And because of that, the robe has not wrapped itself around to the point that it covers our vitals. And it is a breastplate of righteousness. What does Yahweh's breastplate of righteousness? If we're to put on the full armor of Yahweh, what does Yahweh's righteousness look like? A robe. It's a robe. Go look in Scripture. It's a robe. It's a robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61. Oaks and robes. That's a good song right there. (laughs) Oaks and robes. Tied together with the truth of how he sees you. In his son's robe of righteousness. Not the prodigal son. The redeemed heir. Not sinners saved by grace. In the lineage of the firstborn among many brethren, kings and priests in the earth. Not sinners saved by grace. Do you know what that is? It's a cop out. Nobody can expect me to be involved in seeing anybody get healed or the kingdom getting financed or marriages get put back together or serving. These are the kind of people that for 10 years they'll drop their kids off at the nursery and children's church and come in here and cry and never cross their mind maybe they could be back there serving. Because I got to get healed up. You still getting healed up? Why? Because you're still partnering with a lie that causes that robe around you to be fleeting at best. That robe around you to be disconnected. It's not over the vitals yet. So the truth comes. And then do you, do you, do you know then what our feet are shod with? The gospel of peace. And we put on a Roman soldier's armor in order to walk in peace. The shoes are in, let me say it like this. The shoes are permission for entrance into the gospel that is of peace. Of the government of his peace. The government will be upon his shoulders. And of the government of his peace, Isaiah, there will be no end. Not from peace to war, peace to war, peace to war. Peace to peace to peace. Walking in peace is the only way you will legally be authorized to appropriately wield the only piece of offensive weaponry mentioned in the book of Ephesians. The sword of the Spirit. I heard people say, well, the, even a Roman shield had spikes on it and they would use that shield as a piece of offensive. We're not talking about a Roman shield. The, Jesus wasn't super pro the Romans. <laughs> Paul was a little too pro the Romans from time to time. You can sit on that one for a minute. But Jesus was not super pro the Romans, the Roman government, or Roman soldiers. 
He's not trying to tell us dress up like a Roman soldier. He's saying get so confident that your mind is covered with Yahweh's idea of salvation and your vitals are covered with Yahweh's definition of righteousness and it's all tied together with the truth that won't believe a lie that you walk in a degree of peace that now makes it legal for you to wield the sword of the Spirit. Do you know what it is? The promises of God. Do you know the most valuable piece of offensive weaponry I have? Thus says the Lord. The promises of God are literally the sword that penetrates into the darkness that brings a division, the scripture says, between that that is soulish and that that is spiritual. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates, pierces, and divides asunder the soulish from the spirit. Literally, what the word of the Lord does is the word of the Lord divides that consciousness in you that gives permission for soulish paradigms. So when Melanie began to talk this morning about the armor melting off of her, all this started coming to me right there in a moment. While she's praying in the Spirit and talking about the armor melting off of her, I begin to see her from behind her. I'm looking at her in this peripheral, and I'm beginning to see her not susceptible, vulnerable. If I could spend the next hour defining for you the radical difference between vulnerability and susceptibility, it would deal with you about why you're not opening up. Because you're confusing vulnerability with susceptibility. And in righteousness, there is no more susceptibility, which is the only legal permission for authentic vulnerability. You'll never lead well until you get this because you'll need validation from people which creates susceptibility to you being disrobed. You partner with a lie. Righteousness is untied from you. And you know what happens? You get your heart broken. You didn't get your heart broken because that person had access to your heart. You got your heart broken because they had an access to your heart Yahweh did not have to your heart. Salah. The issue is not he broke my heart, she broke my heart, they broke my heart. The issue is the wrong people held your heart. When I get rooted in righteousness, when I put the crown of salvation on with the robe of righteousness, tied together with the truth of beloved identity, all of a sudden I begin to take up a faith Righteousness generates its own brand of faith. And the faith that we have exercised has been impotent and impoverished and insufficient because it was a faith that did not come out of the hands of an individual robed in righteousness. So do you know what we did? We wished and called it faith. We fantasized and called it hope. You start walking in peace... And you know what starts to happen as you begin to walk in peace? You begin to actually believe that thus saith the Lord can be used as a sword that gets you out of the inconsistencies of soulishness. You want to have a large church? Minister soul to soul. Because what most people want is an environment where their soul gets impacted. Which we believe, this, I believe this is an a insufficient definition, but it is a definition, that the soul is inclusive of mind, will, and emotion. Most ministry that people crave is the kind of ministry that appeals to mind, will, and emotion. Spirit to spirit ministry is what the Bible identifies as deep crying out to deep, which is what I teach is the law of relatable dimensions. You only know how deep you are based on what speaks to you. Deep cries out to deep. The, the, the law is true in that it remains truth in a state of introversion. So if you, if you flip that around, it must be true then that shallow cries out to shallow. And if you want to have a large church, do the shallow thing. Because there will be a lot of people that can hear that. 
But if you want to have a company of people that can leverage, thus says the Lord, until it becomes a sword that penetrates so deeply that now you have a group of people that do... Listen, the Bible said when Adam sinned, he exalted his soul. Did you know that? Probably not. I, I didn't until recently. When Adam sinned, he exalted his soul. Now, we always made sin about the flesh. The action is an activity of the flesh. The desire is actually manifested by soulishness. When Adam sinned, he exalted his soul, not his flesh. So here was, I don't know why I'm going this far, but I am. So maybe it'll help us. I hope to God it's helping me. I hope it's helping you. So here was the, the Adam had rulership in his life by way of the spirit. Okay? The soul actually was there to reinforce the spirit and the flesh was there to serve the soul in such a way that it appropriately reinforced the spirit. So Adam was under the government of his spirit. When he sinned, spirit and soul switched places. And spirit began to then be governed by soul which created a law of limitation because now Adam is not functioning in the garden by way of the spirit. Adam is now having to function by way of his mind. Pre-fall, I believe Adam had 100% of the operation of his brain. Pre, why, why don't you? He named every species in the world. Shaka Khan. Okay, he named every species in the world. Right? It got heavy. I had to lighten the mood. Y'all don't look at me like that when you're in here playing Guns N' Roses in the church. I'm about to clean this place out, consecrate it, and go on a fast. Stupid people around me. I'll tell you, playing holiest women in the church coming to Def Leppard t-shirts on. What have we done here? I blame this all on you, Petri. I just blame it all on you. And I, I'm... None of us really even had to know who went back there and put that song on. We knew. Petri. The Nazarite. Well, when he got off that Nazarite train, he left the whole tracks, left the train station. That pendulum has swung way over here. <laughs> he ain't no Nazarite no more. The exaltation of the soul created an inferior governmental structure in the interior world of Adam who now is no longer using his mind for what his mind was designed for. He's having to start to use his mind for what his spirit was designed for. When his mind is appropriately serving his spirit, his mind is is only able to function in concert with what his spirit craves. When you exalt your soul above your spirit, now your spirit is only allowed to function in what your mind allows it to. That's why analytical people have a hard time with the kingdom. This is some teaching that if we get this, I'm just gonna, it's going to cause us to rethink some things as it relates to righteousness, man. Do you know when, when, that there, when the Bible says that Jesus laid down his life, Dutch Sheets has a phenomenal teaching on this. Actually, he has written a book about it. You should get it. It's called Becoming Who You Are. It's, called, it's my favorite book he's ever written, Becoming Who You Are. It, it, they, they like named it Roll Away Your Stone or something. That was dumb. That was, that's what happens when you have publishers and uh, you have people who don't understand the kingdom, trying to make money off people who understand the kingdom. Sorry. Anyway, sidebar. That's why my book is sitting over there in my bag right there because I'm not fixing to let those people touch it. So we'll just keep it on the down low between us. I'll make y'all some copies. <laughs> we'll bootleg that thing. That's we, I'm, you know, listen, you know me. I'm not going to sell it anyway. I've never sold anything in my life. I'm not fixing to start now because I got a book. Books, actually. But I'm not going to start selling them. I want you to get this. This is crucial. When the Bible says Jesus laid down his life, or it tells us to lay down our life. There are three words in the Bible for life. Zoe, the God life. Bios, right? The biology, you see you get the word biology? The biological life. And then there's suke, 
which is the word for soul. When Adam sinned, he exalted his suke. Never anywhere in the Bible does it say Jesus laid down his bios. Never, watch this, anywhere in the Bible does it say Jesus obviously laid down his zoe. It says he picked up his zoe. It only says he laid down his suke. And he invites us to lay down our suke so that we can manifest zoe. What is he in essence saying? A hundred percent of the time what Jesus laid down was the soulishness that Adam exalted. So that you and I could live with a word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to pierce and divide all the way to the division of soul and spirit. What Jesus paid for is for you to no longer be under the government of your thinking, but for your thought process to be generated by you being under the government of the spirit. For the spirit is like the wind. You don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes. The scripture then says, so is the man born of the spirit like the wind. You don't know where he comes from and you don't know where he goes because you're done making decisions based on what makes sense. And you're now making decisions based on the governmental rule of the spirit which has historically instructed people to do things that are absolutely contrary to the law of common sense. People who love me and cared about me, I've shared this story many times. When I left the job that I had and everything I was doing and things that I loved and enjoyed and I went and moved out in the middle of nowhere and moved into this house trailer and said yes to the ministry and quit my job and I'm going to serve God. And if I starve, I'm going to starve serving God. I had people who love me, who are wiser than me, who are more experienced than me, come to me and say, now listen, I know you're zealous. You have had a couple fads, three or four hundred things you've been passionate about, chill out. God gave you common sense. And I said, that sounds right, but I was conflicted. So I went to my little single wide trailer that I couldn't afford to put skirting around the bottom. The, the plumbing that ran from the trailer to the septic tank was not buried because I didn't have the money for that. The well was 18 feet deep, a little orange. For those of you that's not from the country, that water was a little orange. Tammy is rolling her eyes right now because she has had the experience of going to the trailer. That's Listen, listen. It was sat on the Alabama River, which ain't Lake Murray. Okay? It's nasty. Okay? <laughs> nasty. Y'all know that word? Nasty water. I would pump water straight up out the Alabama River. I'd put a sump pump in that deal because the well would go dry, and i just pump water right out the river. i just bathe in the river water just right next to the paper mill. I don't know why I got this twitch, but every once in a while. <laughs> so I went to my little trailer where I learned to preach to cotton stalks. Before I ever had any people listen to me, I walk up and down those. I got every piece of cotton in, in Altauga County, Alabama saved. Because I would go up and down them cotton. I'm going to tell you, you better get right with God. I see sin on you, perversion, lust, pride. I'd seven deadly sins. I'd preach to every cotton stalk. I never had a problem with them. No, no Jezebel cotton stalks. It was awesome. And I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I got these people around me who love me, who care about me, who have more wisdom than me, telling me you gave me common sense. How do I reconcile that with what I feel about taking this venture into the call on my life? And he said, son, if you have anything common, it didn't come from me. I don't have any common sense to give. I told a man to build a boat on dry ground who was awaiting a flood on a planet that had never received a drop of rain. God come to Noah and tell him, build a boat. And he said, which body of water would you like for me to put it in? He said, I want you to put it up there on top of that hill. He said, there's no water there. He said, yeah, but there's going to be a flood. And Adam said, what's a flood? And God said, when we get too much rain, he said, what's rain? The water had been, in the presence of the firmament, the water had been provided from the earth 
for man. Now this whole new idea of rain falling was going to come. And Noah had to deal with everybody thinking he had lost his flipping mind out here building a boat. Why? Because Yahweh was causing a man to make decisions under the government of his spirit that hears the word of the Lord, not his soul that wants to engage the mind of common sense. Go fight the giant with a slingshot. And do you know what the first thing the, the you know what the first thing the government of Saul tried to do, Melanie? Put armor on him. Because they saw him as susceptible. He knew he was not susceptible because he'd been sufficiently vulnerable. He had already been searched in the wilderness with a harp in his hand. Playing, come on, he'd already been searched in the wilderness with a harp in his hand, playing to a handful of sheep, killing bears and lions while nobody was around to see it. So they said, we need to cover you up, protect you, because you look fragile and susceptible. And he said, I've been far too vulnerable to believe I could ever be susceptible. And here's what, here's what, here's a, here's a random theory. I believe if David had fought Goliath in Saul's armor, he still would have won. I believe that. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe God would have let him die because he wore Saul's armor. I just believe the spirit of Saul would have got credited with the victories of David. And David would have spent the rest of his life trying to wear something that didn't actually fit. Many are calloused because they tried to wear armor that doesn't actually fit. And now he's calling you into the robe of righteousness. And I'm telling you, if you've got a religious spirit in you, you'll start to feel guilty when you take your Roman soldier gear off and start to put this nice, plush, amazing, comfortable, customized, tailored, well-fitted robe on you. And you'll start saying, well, I feel like, kind of like I'm being irresponsible to all the warfare I'm supposed to be doing. But, but listen, listen. When he calls us to warfare, he's not calling us to hand-to-hand combat. And if David had worn Saul's armor, you know what he would have ended up in? Hand-to-hand combat. Do you know what he was designed for? An airstrike. That's how much effort is involved. Hits, hits. I'm, I didn't come preach on David and Goliath, but I can if I need to. I have before, believe me. So the stone hits him right here. And he falls forward. How's that work? The stone hits him right here. And the scripture says he falls forward. Because Yahweh wanted to make sure nobody got confused into believing it's the rock that took him out. Not by might. Nor by power. But by my spirit. All I'm letting you do is participate in a victory that's already been sealed. And when that rock hit him in the head, Yahweh said, perfect, that's the last straw I needed right there. Push him right into the ground. What is happening is a people are being delivered from an inferior idea of what it means to be armored so they can step into an authentic idea of what it means to be robed. One's great for war. The other's better for intimacy. I spent two weeks. Let me tell you something. Kristen's birthday's today, by the way. KK's birthday's today. 29 and single. Wealthy. Got money. Amazing brother. Amazing brother. One amazing brother. Some iffy sisters, but one amazing brother. So. So I've been, for three weeks, I've been shopping for a robe for Tammy for her birthday because Tammy's birthday's Saturday. So I've been shopping for a robe for Tammy for her birthday. Is that what y'all are buying her too? Y'all got that look on your face like she's going to get multiple robes. And nobody has ever been more specific in their life about the length of the sleeve, the roll of the neck, the fabric, we, we, we went from that one's going to be too hot to that one's going to be too cold. To, would you tell me what type of season you plan on wearing it in? So I, I got, she just went to the bathroom so she knows, I got one. Okay, I got one. And literally, literally there's a shift in consciousness beginning to happen on the inside of me. 
as it relates to what he actually means when he says the robe of righteousness. And for me, it feels, and this is the only way I know to describe it, as if I've never really ever worn anything that fit right but this. Ministry didn't fit right. Leadership. I'm not saying I'm not saying you're not good at it. It doesn't fit right. And there are specificities to the way he designs the robe of righteousness that it literally causes you to believe everything on your journey has in some measure been on hold until he let you put this on. And when he let you put this on, it was making an announcement that you were coming out of a conflict consciousness and into an intimacy consciousness. Now remember, Samson has a revelation of the power of war. Okay, Picks up the gates of the Philistines and marches into their village. Ties fire. I don't know how you do this. He ties firebrands into the tails of foxes. There's some stuff in the Bible. You should read it sometime. So he ties firebrands in the tails of foxes and sends them into the crops of his enemies to destroy their resource. Takes the jawbone of an ass and kills a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone, which was a violation because he was not allowed to touch anything dead. But as long as we're winning, we don't care if you violated. We don't care if you violated the covenant if you're getting enough people. Every one of the thousand Philistines he killed that we bragged on him for killing was all done as a violation of a covenant because he was touching the jawbone of a dead animal and his vow said he couldn't touch anything dead. Esther goes over here, spends a year getting marinated. I don't know nothing about this. Oils, spices, Oils and spices. And people saying, you ought to get out there on the battlefield, brother. I've been on the battlefield. Laying down in these spices is harder. It takes no degree of holiness to end up in conflict with your adversary. It takes absolute exclusivity and consecration to end up in the bed with your king. And as a man, I am much more predisposed to fighting my enemies than I am getting in bed with my king. It's much easier. I'm going to mess with you now. Come on, we're going to go a little bit further. It's much easier for me to identify with a soldier than it is for me to identify with a bride. But Esther's breakthrough is 10,000 times more significant for the nation of Israel than is Samson's. If I told you we were going to list the great warriors in the Bible... Gideon, Barak, Samtha, Jephthah, Ehud. We could go on and on and on about these great warriors. In the Bible. I've never had anybody list Esther. Because we have an inferior concept of what victory in battle actually looks like. It looks like somebody who has so allowed themselves to be tenderized in the oil of communion that when you approach the king, he hands out his scepter and says, anything you want up to half of the kingdom. Feel the tension? Come on, do you feel the tension when you start talking about it? Because I, tell me I can be Samson. I'm going to get my hair, grow my hair out, get me a Nazarite vial. Dress up like a soldier. But a wedding dress. I mean, I got the legs for it, but this beard and stuff's going to throw it off. I'm... My wife continually tells me how hot my legs are. Do you know how I translate that? The rest of you has gone to hell, but you still have great legs. I'll take what I get. She, every, I mean, all the time, boom, you got good legs. I'm like, yeah. What she's really saying is, how, when did that peck become a breast? That's what I would like to know. That, there was, when I met you, there was a pectoral there. Oh, my God. Is that an ab or a love handle? I can't tell. Well, just work whatever you got to do. Just do what you got to do. A wedding dress? 
A wedding dress? What if, what, if, what if your victories start to come by way of your intimacy instead of your strength? What if he starts to get all the credit for all the wins? Because all I did was stay still. You came back with the head of my enemies and you called it my victory. And all I did was praise. And all I did was worship. And all I did was stay still. What if, what if the new narrative is we put on his armor salvation, righteousness, truth, peace, faith. And then all of a sudden this sword begins to come out of the mouth and it takes a culture that is governed by the soulish realm and it begins to flip what Adam broke in the garden, which is the intended order of sovereignty. Spirit, soul, flesh. So is the man of the spirit. Like the wind. You don't know where he comes from and you don't know where he goes. I just want to, I want to, I want to, I don't know what to do next. I know we probably need to receive an offering. I know it's already late, but I'm going to send you into some peculiarities today by apostolic decree. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Thank you. You can come back now. (laughs) You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Now, all of us prophetic people use that verse as permission for how weird we are. But that's not what the word peculiar means. The word peculiar is a Greek word, peripoiesis. And it literally means one belonging exclusively to another. The word peculiarity would have been better defined exclusivity. Which in this culture makes you peculiar. Because we belong exclusively to ourselves. Exclusively to our careers. Exclusively to the culture. But you find a company of people in this postmodern society that is living in a degree of exclusivity where God is first and there is no second. You, 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 you find God over here. You find a company of people with God over here as first and there's not even anything else in the list. Everything else that gets categorized into priority has to fall in a whole nother line because there is no second priority to belonging exclusively to Him. That is why Yahweh is breathing on companies like this all over the country. Because he's finding people who said, you know what? I don't want to live for my career and add Jesus on Sunday morning. I don't want to live for retirement and add Jesus on Sunday morning. I don't want to live for the college football team that I root for and add Jesus on Sunday. I want Jesus to become the driving force behind every decision that is made in my existence. And you start living that way, friend, you'll look peculiar to a culture that thinks Christianity is giving God a leftover hour and a half of your energy. Energy at the end of a week. What's happening is this righteousness revelation is causing a flip of the soul. We're being tied together. This, this message of righteousness is being tied around this family. I didn't know I was going here this morning, but I feel wind on it. This message of righteousness is being tied around a family. And a revelation you may have had on you that was loosely adhered to you is going to begin to be cinched to you in a way that you're going to find what fits you like nothing else has ever fit you in your life. And that is he who knew no sin became sin that I through him might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Not being found in my own righteousness. Come on. Not being found in my own righteousness, but being viewed exclusively through the lens of His righteousness because I belong to Him exclusively. The highest order of protocol within the covenant of marriage is exclusivity. It's not provision. It's exclusivity. The highest governmental law within the covenant of marriage is exclusivity. If he's calling us to a bride, bridegroom relationship, then you're going to find a jealousy that promotes his unwillingness to share you. You feel it? You're going to find a degree of jealousy that makes him unwilling to share you. And I'm telling you, when you begin to think that way, all of a sudden the spirit becomes the governor of every thought. Do you know what happens when that, man, I just feel like I should stop, but I don't want to. Let me get a drink of water and 
I probably got two more hours in me if I get a sip. You know what happens when you know the Spirit is the governor of your thought? You quit justifying away your dreams. You start to believe that that dream didn't get there by way of the soul. You know what I'm telling people? If you said yes to this devotional water, to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lifestyle Yahweh's Institute here, you can start to trust all your dreams again. Because anything I'm still dreaming about on this side of what he brought me through, I trust that he's the one that left it there. Come on, I don't trust anything I dreamed about before I came into this grace to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But on this side, I'm starting to dream. If that dream's still there, then it was a dream that Yahweh placed on the inside of me. And you know what I'm doing? I'm starting to trust my thoughts. Do you know what trusting your thoughts does? Makes you confident to the decree, the whisper of His voice that actually sounds like your thought. Do you know why people can't hear the voice of God? Because He sounds so much like you. I want you to feel this change in this room right now. What are you dreaming about that's still there after everything He brought you through? What are you hungry for that's still there after everything He brought you? You know what He did in me, Tony? Resurrected horses. I laid that one down because I couldn't trust whether that was the Lord or not. And then I came through these waters and he began to give that back all over again. The, the property, the land, the hunting, the things that Yahweh is handing over to us. My relationship with his folks. And I used to beat myself up for being passionate about those things. And then I came through this and I said, you know what? If that dream is still there, if that desire is still there, if that thought is still there, and I'm under the government of the Spirit to the degree I was designed to, then not only can I permit it, but I can enjoy it in a way I've never enjoyed it before because it survived the crucible of being stripped of the Roman soldier's armor and I've come out on the other side of a robe of righteousness and I'm starting to see he likes me having fun. I'm starting to see I can hear his voice better when I'm not broken sick. Come on, I'm starting to see I can hear his voice better when I'm not wrestling with poverty and lack and need. I'm starting to see I can hear his voice better. I'm starting to fly first class a little bit. I wouldn't let myself do that for years. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank and I would not allow myself to fly first class for years. I'm starting to fly first class a little bit. My children can teach you what a daddy hotel is. Am I telling the truth, Elijah? What is a daddy hotel? Daddy hotel is a hotel where you don't enter through the lobby. You back your car right up to the door. You're given a metal key and an air conditioner is on the outside of the building blowing in maybe. You can shake the towels and then look at the light through the towel if you stay in a daddy hotel. But that mentality is beginning to shift on the inside of me. And I'm beginning to say, you know what? He wants me rested. Not that I'm unwilling to do those things. I spent years doing missions and flying all over the world. I'm willing to do whatever, but there is a promotion that's beginning to come by way of the Spirit. And he's, going to, he's beginning to say, you know what I need you to begin to function as? One robed in righteousness. Instead of one here to survive the test of life so you can get all your great rewards in the afterlife. To have this covenant and be poor is selfish. I'm going to say that again. To have this promise and still be in poverty is a choice to remain in selfishness. Somebody's got to begin to leverage this increase into somebody else, which means somebody's going to have to cause that word of living faith to come alive on the inside of them that believes they're not supposed to spend the rest of their life holding up a shield that dodges bullets. They're actually supposed to leverage the promises of faith by the sword of the Spirit that is thus says the Lord. I'm going to send you into some peculiarity. I'm going to, I'm going to mess with you a little bit, Griff. I mean, you know I love you, so this will be easy for us. Even with the news that I got today, I call you out of common sense. I call you out of provision consciousness. That you just do what you got to do to provide. Not, 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 not so, son. Not as an heir of this. 
not as the lineage and offspring of this and the lineage and offspring of this. I call you into an abundance. I call you into a prosperity. Come on, you know what it's like to function as a senator's grandson, but you're going to know now what it's like to function as a king's actual son. And I call you into that inheritance that you're not just going to have to work the job connected to your degree. Come on, you're not just going to have to live in the house that's close to the job that's connected to your degree. But I'm calling you home. And I'm declaring that you're going to begin to be seated in a place of fulfillment and joy that you have never known before. And your children are not going to be casually connected to what the Lord's doing here, but they are going to be shareholders in the middle of this expression of revival in the earth. So I say concerning you, there's some peculiar opportunities coming your way and leap at the chance. You are not susceptible to failure. You're just vulnerable to being held by the one who never lets you down. I call you into the consciousness of the assurity that you're being held in the hand of the one who never lets you down. I must say some weird things. I have insurance, but I have not had insurance. You'll be okay. I have insurance. I have health insurance. I have life insurance. I don't have dental insurance because I don't go to the dentist. Sorry, where's our dentist at? I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, dude. Sorry, sorry. I mean, I'll come see you. I'll come see you. So. I got good teeth. I just don't go to the dentist. That's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother day. I have insurance, but I have not had insurance and I'm not more secure with it. I'm calling you into a faith that lets you begin to make some decisions that are not based by causing the spirit to serve the soul. Well, I would do that, but my mind's telling me it doesn't make sense. No, that's not how this one works. In righteousness, that script gets flipped, and all of a sudden the spirit begins to dictate the thought process of the soul, and you begin to venture into ownership instead of settling for slavery. There's not a person in this room that should ever be content to only be an employee. I'm not saying there's not a season of faithfulness there. There has been for all of us. But don't you stop there and let religion teach you because of your intellect or your education or your experience or your background. That's all you'll ever be. I'm calling you up higher than that. I'm calling you into different thought processes. I'm calling you, I'm leveraging the scriptural promise of witty inventions to be able to come into you. Of not fear of financial failure. What would you do for God and the kingdom if you had no fear of your financial future? I call you into that present reality. Do not live your life to end up with an RV at 63. You can have the kingdom right now. You can have the great feast right now. Don't, don't, let, don't let Babylon tell you that's how you secure your future. I'm telling you, he wants you to take the road trip right now. He wants you to enjoy the adventure right now. He wants you to have the dream life with your wife right now. I'm not, I'm, listen, again, you know me. I'm not talking about slothfulness. I have a lot of issues. Work ethic is not one of them. Have you met my dad? <laughs> I have a lot of issues. Work ethic from our family is not an issue that we deal with, any of us. Let me say this to you. I want you to get this. I'm calling you into a consciousness that your name is not Jaira. It's just that. And what we did is we let the culture teach us what provider looks like, and then we begin to illegally step into the role of Jaira. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. He's the provider and he wants to invite you into a revelation that creates a security in you that says we can't fail. Because this one's not coming by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I want to leverage you into the peculiarity of thinking differently by way of exclusivity. I belong exclusively to him and I cannot fail. I belong exclusively to Him and I cannot lack. I belong exclusively to Him and therefore I'm the head and not the tail. Let me say it like this. I belong exclusively to Him. That makes me a lender and not a borrower. I call you out of a consciousness of debt. I call you out of dependence on banks and Babylonian systems. And I call you to be able to walk in a degree of increase and in resource that lets you leverage the greatness for which that you were designed. I call you out of slavery and into royalty. Cool. I call you out of 
being branded as a slave and I call you into the identity of sonship and I declare concerning you that you have the mind of the learned. I declare there's not a learning disability present within this room, but your mind is being renewed and you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that absolutely perfect, acceptable will of God. I call you into that now. Come on, I call you into that right now. I call you out of poverty concerning your own intellect. And I call you into believing I have the mind of Christ. Come on. I have the mind of Christ and nothing is too difficult for me. I'm not limited by my education. I'm not limited by my background. I'm not limited by what type of family I came out of. I call you out of a consciousness that you inherited heart disease. And I declare over you when you were born again, you got a new coding in your DNA. And rather than having faith to believe that your heart is still functioning after the curse, I call you into believing you are not predisposed to diabetes. You're predisposed to 120 years of life according to the scripture. And you are getting healthier and healthier, not sicker and sicker. Come on, somebody, Yahweh will extend your years if you'll leverage this promise into your world this morning. It's peculiar. I know it's peculiar, but it's the kingdom of Almighty God. And this is what we were born for call you into that exclusivity quit saving for a rainy day and make a rainy day come on you're a rainmaker. you're a rainmaker. that's what you are you're one that stands between heaven and earth and with the same like passions of Elijah according to James 5 17 you point and you say heaven you will rain I speak that this natural drought we've been in in this region is coming to an end tonight. I'm asking you right now that this dry, crunchy, burned up grass out here is going to receive her rains. It's going to receive her rains. I'm declaring we're going to be see. Listen, a rain that saturates, soaks, and penetrates without any fragment of destruction. Peculiarity is what you were designed for. And I'm telling you, when you hear this, there can be a tension on the inside of you, but something's rising up saying, you know, this is really what this is supposed to all be about. I'm not supposed to find me a good Bible-believing church I can attend once a week. I'm supposed to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I'm to get a word of knowledge walking through the grocery store. I'm to get a word of wisdom while I'm standing in the aisle at Walmart. Come on. I'm to send a text because Yahweh prompted me to that leverages somebody into a degree of freedom they would not have gotten into otherwise. I'm to hear the whisper of that one is ripe. And when I hear the whisper that one is ripe, I present the goodness of the gospel to them. And the goodness of God brings them into repentance. You become a reaper. Instead of trying to find a church that really cares about souls... You find a field full of souls and become a person that cares about souls. The principal place of reaping in agriculture has never been the barn. This ain't the field. Quit depending on us to reap all the lost people. You're the ones that are actually sent into the fields that the scripture says are wide unto harvest. So become a reaper. I know that's peculiar. But it's a peculiarity that exclusivity produces 100% of the time, man. So what I release to you today is the grace to yield to greater exclusivity. Yahweh, may I belong more to you today than I did tomorrow. And may I belong more to you tomorrow than I did today. And I, I take back the pieces of me that have been divided and spread elsewhere. And I bring them back to the one who owns me, bought and paid for. And I, in intimacy, ask for the grace to become the reward of your suffering. An undivided people wearing the full armor of God. I don't want any armor on me that you don't have on you. But I want every piece of armor on me that you have on you. Put on the full armor of God. 